All right, so an official welcome to everyone who is here today for the webinar on how to build a career of meaning and impact. There is a special reason why you are here and that's something called you to this. So the name of the webinar, something in the description, spiked your curiosity and we're really curious to find out why you're here. So if you can um, share in the chat and you wanna probably meet yourselves and um, if you wanna share in the chat what brought you here, that would be great because one of the um, beautiful things of bringing people together in person or virtually is actually that oftentimes you hold also interesting information for each other. So it could be by the laws of serendipity that maybe two people that come to this webinar to learn something from Amani Institute today will actually learn something from each other. So if you want to put yourself um, into the chat now where you are, um, maybe one, if you can put into one sentence what brings you here, what is your curiosity that will be interesting for us as um, the panelists, but also for you to see um, who else is in the room, okay? And um, without further ado, I'm gonna start with sharing my screen. Um, let me see, we are going here. Um, so I can introduce you the entire webinar. And we're starting here. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, great. All right, so what we will do in the next hour is we will go, first a little welcome, um, and then I will introduce quickly Amani Institute so you know who's actually behind this. And um, Vicky, if you wanna say something about Profello, please also, um, I will, you're welcome to. We're really happy to do this together with you. Um, then I, will like, I would like to introduce our panel. I'm super excited to have you all here today. Um, uh, Social Innovation Management Fellows from Amani Institute that they're happy to share about their careers and their perspectives. And then we will look into the question, the main question of the webinar actually, what are the opportunities in the sector and what are the most sought after skills? And while we are sharing, you're welcome to share questions in the chat and definitely we will open up also um, later on just to have a conversation together. Okay, so um, let me just see. I have here some more people and I'm opening the chat. Great, wonderful. All right, so while I'm sharing about Amani Institute, I would like you to share where in the world you are and what are the um, curiosities and questions that are um, bringing you here. And please share it with everyone in the chat so that everyone else can also see it. Um, all right, so my name is Geraldine. You can call me Gigi. I am the Global Community Director at Amani Institute. I'm also part of the founding team at Amani Institute. And we started actually seven years ago in Kenya, in East Africa, um, with the vision of creating an institute that provides training for people that seek to build meaningful careers, to change the world, and we were, Seeing there was a lack in, in the market. There were a lot of young people looking for um, um, ways on how to build this type of careers and they weren't really sure how they could build them. And in the sector, in social entrepreneurship, but also in the traditional um, uh, NGO sector, we saw a lot of um, senior leaders complaining about the lack of talent, that they couldn't find the right people to scale the work with. And then it was like, okay, there's a bit of a mismatch and what can we do to bridge that? And so we started out in Kenya because Kenya is um, in Nairobi, the, the capital of uh, Kenya is a place where a lot of innovation is happening. And we wanted to also kind of flip this global mindset that a lot of people have that, um, you know, when you're from the West, you think you have to go into a developing country and help. But actually, it is true that you can... Um, that we can all create a better world together and we can move globally and we will hear a little bit more about those opportunities um, from our panelists later. But it's also true that we can learn a lot from each other in all places in the world. So we wanted to invite people to come to Kenya to learn from the innovation that is happening in the city of Nairobi. Um, but soon we also scaled up and um, in 2015 actually we went to Brazil to a city of Sao Paulo and I know we have someone here from Sao Paulo, Carolina. And there's also equally um, to, to Nairobi, it's an economic engine of a region and there's a lot of things happening. We felt a lot, um, people can learn a lot from um, living and learning in that city. And then finally we also moved 
um, and scaled up to be in India, where we are in Bangalore, which is also a city of innovation. And um, now we have programs running in all those three cities. And we are doing also work globally with clients all around the world that are asking us to create customized learning and development interventions for their companies or their organizations. So this is a little bit of an overview of what we are doing. So we are developing change makers through our social innovation management certificate, for example, or short courses. And we are building capacity of organizations through our customized trainings, for example. And we serve the larger purpose economy through events or creating um, knowledge products. Um, just a little bit about the social innovation management program impact. You can see here we have a lot of people from Latin America. So there's a lot of change makers looking for opportunities. We have less coming from North America. Um, Europe is also sort of like growing. Middle East is, is a bit... Um, um, uh, slow still, but then 23% 20 from Africa and 10% from Asia. And this is just sort of representing the mix of people that is coming to the social innovation management program. Um, how, what are people doing after they do this program with us? They go and work in both more traditional NGOs as well as in companies or in social enterprises. Sometimes they start their own social enterprise. Um, it's a big mix. I think Amani Institute has been mistaken for a social enterprise school for a while, but actually we don't focus on social entrepreneurs. We focus on professionals that want to create social impact, no matter what position or sector they work in. So it can be from the public sector to the private, to the more traditional social impact sector. And we will learn a little bit more about the social innovation management program later. And I can send you more information if you're interested, but basically it's a six month program. There's two months online and then four months in a city like Nairobi, Bangalore, or um, Nairobi, Bangalore and Sao Paulo, um, where you learn with master practitioners, um, we have um, here some examples of the instructors. We always look for people that have um, a lot of expertise. They're really cutting edge in their own field. We feel that universities are covering beautifully um, uh, the academic side of things. So we are looking really for practitioners that people can learn from, core professional skills, um, and people work while they are doing the program so that they that you can really like have a hands on experience of practicing what you're learning and everyone is creating a social innovation project to test out the framework that we're teaching and also goes through a personalized leadership journey and we will hear more about that later as well. The program has won a couple of awards and is accredited through some university partnerships that we have and people that come out of this program, as I said, they're either continuing in their organizations and sometimes they get promoted within the organization. Sometimes they find a new job. Sometimes they go back to university because they feel they want to explore more of another topic that they realize they're interested in. Um, and we have a network of social impact organizations around the world that are our employer partners that are looking for talent. And when they have a vacancy, they share it with us. And then we share it with our fellows to sort of like see how we can help um, connect the dots. This was it um, for now as an overview. I'm not going to go too much into what we are doing with um, larger organizations. If you're interested in that work, um, you can let me know. Um, I want to jump right into the main reason why we're here today. And this is actually our panelists. And I'm so happy and grateful that we have you here today. We have four people that have gone through this program that have different kind of careers. And we felt in conversation with people that are interested in this kind of work, that oftentimes um, there is this question mark, like what, what are the opportunities? What, are, what do I have to do? How can I build this? How do I connect the dots? Some people already work with social impact, but somehow find themselves not happy. And the people that work in the private sector and want to switch into a career of social impact then say, but if I just worked in a company with impact, I would be happy. And then you see, oh no, there is more to it. There's something, um, that, that we can learn from each other about our careers and sort of like see how we start navigating them. So thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Um, and I want to start with you, John. If you can make a small introduction, who you are, what your questions were, and then um, we will move on to the next. 
Okay, so my career has been one of constant change. Uh, I've worked on human rights projects in Sri Lanka where I engage in the design and implementation of a variety of projects at the grassroots level, focused on you know, uh, empowerment of women working in the free trade garment industry. Uh, I've worked as a researcher for the UN Special Advisor on Prevention of Genocide, uh, working on a project for indigenous populations, land disputes and mass atrocities. Um, I've worked as a social impact analyst for a media and tech firm, working on a wide, wide array of issues from domestic violence to climate refugees to combating radicalization. And essentially there we work with specialists and partner organizations across the public and private sector to create social and environmental impact projects that inform, educate and challenge myths and stereotypes, while also creating uh, practical solutions that contribute to solving these issues globally. So. We did that by sort of creating a, a powerful slate of storytelling media, as well as tech products that generate not only returns for the shareholders, but sustainability for the projects that we're working with on the ground. Um, during my time with Imani, I got to work with Growth Africa on their Nike, uh, sorry, their uh, Spring Accelerator project, which was looking to impact the lives of a billion girls by the year 2030. And I also got to engage in consultancy work there as well for foreign firms looking to expand into East Africa. Uh, during my time at, uh, at Amani, I also engaged in my own social innovation project with uh, uh, my classmate Nelson and the ICMSI Development Initiative, whereby we designed and implemented a project that established uh, a cooperative of 50 Indigenous Maasai women, teaching them how to make, sell, package uh, several different types of liquid and bar soaps, as well as providing solar lamps and charging pads and ceramic water filters, all supplied uh, by local Kenyan companies. And since then, there's actually been, which I was excited to hear, over 15,000 of each of those, the solar lamps and the, and the water filters into the community since then. Uh, I've also been in touch with them as, as an advisory capacity since then. I've designed a, uh, the business model for their Maasai Cultural Preservation Center, um, as well as the Stories Cafe. Um, since after Amani, I attained my master's in globalization, business and development from the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex. And currently I'm the director of business development and co-founder of Agrotech Food Security. Essentially, we're using electron accelerators to prevent the decay of crops post harvest without using harmful chemicals. So our mission is twofold. The first is to utilize our technology in partnership with public and private organizations to help bolster food security in the world's um, you know, most vulnerable regions where drought and starvation persist. And the second is to empower farmers around the globe by increasing the health, quality, and yield of their root and tuber crops, ultimately enhancing the economic productivity of their land. And uh, my main questions with regards to building a career of media impact, uh, certainly at the time, I feel like I've solved some of these questions now, but it was always, you know, what makes me want to get up in the morning and affect change? Where does one even find these jobs? Am I good enough to get them once I find them? And how can I find that synergy of you know, what I'm good at, what I'm passionate about, and what pays me enough to survive? Because that's sort of the, uh, the tricky balance that I think we all look to fill, right? And that's about me. Thanks so much, John. There was a lot. I was like, just like trying to follow Sorry. the things Sorry. that you said that you've done. Um, but it is, it is, it sounds really impressive. And what, what just struck me when you, you know, when you ended was it, it's so like, it, it's truly impressive. And then when you're saying, you know, like I'm asking the question, what gets me up in the morning and how can I bring these things together? And am I even good enough? And where do I find the jobs? I think everyone else who's listening is like, yeah, oh my God, you also feel that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I think that is the thing, you know, like um, uh, we are on a journey of navigating how to build, like how to find that sweet spot. And sometimes we've done already a lot of things, but it still is a question that moves us, right? And that is like the question around, how, how do I bring the impact and where it's my sweet spot together? Um, we will talk more about this later. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, as next, I would love to invite Nolanda to share a little bit about her journey. Okay. Well, um, I, I would describe myself as a designer who is very, very passionate about social service and helping people who um, just, I just believe in equitable societies. And so I would sum it up like that. And I think that ever since I was about 19 years old, I have really been focused on trying to figure out how to connect my passion for art with community development and helping people, you know? And so I have a background in design and architecture. I taught for a while. Um, when I found Amani, I was really at a place in my career, um, I was teaching still, and I was really passionate about the charter school program that I was working with and what they were doing to assist um, children 
in low income areas and improve their, their rates going to and through college. And they were doing phenomenal things and I loved it, but I felt very stifled because I felt like there was a lot more that I could do in my career. And I wanted to figure out how to connect more of my passions together. That's when I found Imani. I, you know, it's interesting how things happen. I, I think honestly, I ended up in Imani because I needed a break from um, my regular, the regular uh, path, typical path that I was on at that time. And I needed just to be able to rejuvenate and figure out how to make the shift into a career that I really, really love. I didn't really have any expectations for Armani beyond that, but that's like the hugest thing that you can figure out in your career. Like, how do I make this, you know, you have to get up and go to a job every day. So you want it to count, you want to love it. And so um, I've, like I, I said a little bit earlier, um, so my big idea was always based around um, art-based community development and how to develop opportunities for people who had barriers of entry into the normal job market. And I felt like, you know, there's a lot of people who are, and I really learned this through teaching. There's so many different personalities. There's a lot of people out there who just, they're not going to be a doctor or an engineer, but they can do amazing things. And I think that the typical um, education path, a lot of times does not really get them to a place where they realize that. And so they mm -hmm. kind of just, you know, waffle in life, right? And so I wanted, you know, there's a lot of creative people out there and people who can do things with their hands and have a lot of skill sets that we don't really focus so much on in the U.S. And I wanted to figure out how to um, work with those people so that they could have successful, happy lives and do what they were put here to do. And so that's a very general thing, um, which is, um, so... Amani was great because it helped me to do just that. I was able to come back um, and really try to, without a lot of pressure on me, just I tried to get as much experience as I could in different fields um, around nonprofit. I worked with foster kids and I worked at a, um, I was a director of an after school program that dealt with, with um, foster kids. And I did that for a little while, ended up um, right now, I am managing a basic needs program. And we, I have direct contact with people every day um, who are in a state of crisis in their life. And I get to do awesome things to help them. And so we, it's a food pantry. We have financial assistance for people who are about to be evicted. I work with, um, you know, every day we work with homeless clients. We work with um, people who are, you know, coming from the women's center, battered women. I mean, you never know who's going to walk in the door, but every day, you know, you do something that matters and it's an awesome job. And I had no idea I'd end up here. But the other great thing that it does is that because I'm happy in my career, it gives me time to work on that big idea that I still haven't quite figured out. And so Amani helped me to make that shift. And so um, that's how I would sum it up. Thank you so much, Nolanda. And I think it's beautiful to see um, from agri-tech and food security to what you're doing. There is like, it's already kind of like putting up the field and the question, like what are actually the opportunities and the ways people can um, create work that is meaningful. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think we have next up, Ryan. Um, do you want to All share right. things about yourself? Sure. Hey, everyone. Thanks for spending time with us. Um, so just a nutshell, my career, I started, I studied international development at George Mason University. And then immediately upon graduating, I went and served as a Peace Corps volunteer for two years in Cameroon. And while I was there, I focused on youth development and community health and focused a lot on HIV work, um, prevention and education and counseling and testing. Um, after I finished in Cameroon, I came back to the US briefly for like nine months and I was considering going to grad school, but I was working as a program coordinator for a, like a youth camp in Pennsylvania. Um, and then ended up 
finding a job. I decided it wasn't time to go back to school. I wasn't finding programs that I thought would be useful. Um, so I took a job with a nonprofit in Nairobi um, working with HIV. And I was there for five, for four years as their operations director. Um, and while I was in Nairobi, I came across the Amani program. And um, so I did the SIM, the management program with them. And because I was already based in Nairobi, I continued working with um, Care for AIDS, the nonprofit I was with, as my work placement. And that's where I did my innovation project. So that was in 2016. And so I stayed on in Kenya for two more years in my role and then decided that it was time for me to come back to the US. I kind of, there's a whole lot of there of how I decided, why I decided to do that. But part of it was, I was noticing a lot of the things that I cared about, like social inequality and structural racism and lots of other things. I was kind of like, well, there's a, there's a lot of that in the US. And I feel like I felt a sense of responsibility to come back and kind of apply the things that I learned in the global development sector, kind of apply that in the US, in the local development setting. So I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in political science and community economic development. And I'm researching how local governments can engage with and better serve historically disenfranchised and underserved populations in the US. Um, and while I'm doing that, I'm working with the city of Berwyn. Well, I'm working for a nonprofit that's contracted by the city of Berwyn to do economic and community development. Um, and I've been kind of, I've been with them since June and I'm actually kind of innovating within the role. I was taken on as an economic development specialist and I've kind of reshaped the role and I'm about to request for my title to change to community development um, specialist because that's kind of more what I'm doing. Like, surveys and meetings and um, like a mural project and um, so that's kind of my where I am right now and then one of a main question that I've always had that I think I have, I, I'm at a point where I understand the question better well aside from um, like how do I do what I feel passionate about and also make money that's that's always a question um, but one question that I've always had is um, how can I, especially as someone who happens to be a white male from a global North country, how can I do this work that has impact without reinforcing structures and mentalities that created the problems in the first place? And is my presence here kind of reinforcing those things? Because if they are, then any impact we have, we have is not going to be long-term and it's going to be undermined by these mentalities and structures that exist in the first place and so i think before i didn't fully i'm getting better at articulating that question to myself and i i hope that i never stop asking that um so that's me thanks thank you ryan so much and i think you open up a really important um perspective here which is um you've been working um as a u.s citizen in other countries and you're bringing back a eh, what you you're realizing wow there's a lot of things that we have to address in the US and are addressing, I want to be part of this, but also what you just said about power dynamics and reflecting critically on that. So I think um, that is uh, really important and very beautiful that you brought that to the table. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Irene here. Um, if you just want to go and explain a little bit about yourself, Irene. Sure. Um, I think I'm actually going to start with a question. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, my own background um, as an immigrant in, in, in several different places um, and not as, you know, not as someone from, from the developed part of the world, but rather uh, underdeveloped part of the world and being on the margin everywhere I went, I think really helped shape what, you know, what my career or what I wanted my career to be. So, I mean, since the beginning, I think the question that I kept asking myself was, what was the biggest impact that I could make in this world? Um, and so I started with actually, um, you know, with music. I was, a, I was a professional trombone player for a while. I was a musician. And then I realized that um, as a trombone player, I wasn't going to make as much impact as I wanted. So I then took a really sharp turn into education. And 
So I did, um, I taught and then I went to study policy. I worked in the uh, State Department of Education. I saw how, you know, at the government level, you know, you think that, oh, of course they're doing policy, they're doing large scale changes. Um, but a lot of the times what I ended, up, and I ended up seeing was that they were firefighting because they were not designing the policies in the way that was very practical. They didn't roll it out um, in a way that was um, in touch with the ground. And so we ended up failing and we had to go in and kind of like backtrack. Um, and so that's what I saw at the government level. Um, at the grassroots level, I, I went to work for a grassroots NGO in Kenya, doing very community-based projects, which was great in terms of, you know, having that um, very tangible impact on the ground. But then you realize that there are a lot of infrastructural barriers and structural barriers that um, a local grassroots NGO, it, it's just super, super hard to address. And so in terms of, you know, what is the biggest impact that can be, I, I thought this is great, but there has to be some kind of like combination, you know, with this top down approach and bottom up approach. Um, and then um, I also worked as a university researcher um, for a bit. And I thought, you know, that the methods that we're using is very rigorous the data that we're using, like all that stuff, like the technical stuff is great. I don't know who's reading our stuff. I don't know who's reading our papers. And, you know, and the colleagues that I worked with, they were mostly PhD students and postdocs who have never worked before. And so they were just like researching other people's research. And I thought, you know, this is not where I need to be right now in my career. I really need to like go out and see for myself what's actually happening and, and, and if I come back to this, you know, rigorous academic research, I could come back with actual content. And, and so I left and then I started sort of searching for a way that we could actually combine the rigor of, you know, academic research with the kind of bird's eye view vantage point of government level um, work with the very much contextualized work of the grassroots NGOs. And that's when I stumbled upon, um, you know, this concept of social entrepreneurship and social innovation. Mm. And so I, I spent a year and a half working in Asia um, with a social enterprise, um, designing and delivering design thinking programs with local NGOs that was very much contextualized to the, to the local language and culture. So I did that for a year and a half. And um, yeah, and I think I, I reached a point where you know, because I kept asking myself, what was this, you know, what was the highest level of impact that I could make? Um, I, I realized that it was time for me to move on. And that's when I came across um, Amani. Um, and through the Amani program, I was able to intern with um, Ashoka. And, you know, and, and very luckily, after my time at Ashoka India, um, you know, I went through the hiring process and I ended up in the DC office. And the project that I'm working on now um, is actually a brand new project at Ashoka. Um, and it's, it, it, it does exactly what I wanted to before, which was how do we get corporations and social entrepreneurs and governments and citizen sector organizations to work together on very concrete topics to achieve something that, that they cannot achieve on their own. Um, so that's, that's where I ended up. Um, and I'm, you know, very happy right now because um, I, you know, it's like, I mean, it's very ambiguous. It's very uncertain. We're trying to make something up from like very little. So it's exciting. It's scary. It's very, very scary. Um, but yeah, I, I do think like the question that I, that I asked myself in the beginning have really led to, you know, this point in time. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's been great. And, and I have so much to thank Amani for, which I'll talk about later. Thanks, Irene. <laughs> thank you for doing your work. Actually, in fact, everyone, thank you for doing your work. And everyone who's already also here in the webinar, if you're already working with Impact, thank you. And if you're looking for, for doing it, 
go for it because the world really needs you. <laughs> like if we're thinking about the world, it's so clear if you're, if you're not in total state of denial that we need the most brilliant minds and the biggest hearts and the most um, up to action people to actually take on um, and, and shape professions in a way that it has social impact. And this is something that I'm personally really excited about because I see it, Amani, people from the private sector, from universities, from the public sector, from the grassroots levels, from, from more bigger NGO um, backgrounds come together and learn from each other. In a, in a typical social innovation management class, you will have people with so many different backgrounds from so many different fields. Um, and there is something beautiful about seeing that there is so many people who care about the world and that are really serious about trying to find the best way they can make an impact. So um, that is a beautiful question that you, that you just ended with, Irene, um, living with. It's like, what is the biggest impact I can make? And if I can do it, why not, right? So let's see, let's see um, a little bit more about um, our main questions of this webinar. So something that we proposed in the event right description of this webinar was like, what are actually the different opportunities out there? Because there is again, oftentimes a very limited understanding of what the social impact sector even means. In India, we've had just recently a series of events that, called, that is called, um, they're hugely successful and it's called demystifying social impact careers. And there's something around still people thinking, if you say I work with social impact, they think you are with grassroots or NGO type organizations which is, by the way, great if you are. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it at all. But the truth is that there's, of course, a vastly bigger realm of opportunities um, how we can create social impact. So from tech for social change to impact investing to um, uh, you know, agri agricultural innovations to urban planning to architecture to um, education, obviously, um, policy innovation and so on and so forth. So um, let's explore a little bit here um, a, a, as a next step, these questions. And then also I think something that um, we hear a lot from people as a question is around the skills that people need. Because obviously in universities, we um, learn really well something about more um, the, the content, the topics, the different topics, right? So if you're interested in, in policies or in business or, um, in uh, agriculture or in energy, you can you can you can study and get more expertise, content expertise, and analytical skills and so on. But oftentimes, when we then start working, we realize there's a whole other set of skills that we haven't been trained in um, in university. Um, maybe in project management when you're leading your your student groups, um, or if you're active in some extracurricular activities. But technically, there are a, a whole set of professional skills that we then learn as we go through our careers. And um, something that we have found at Amani Institute is that while you learn at your, on, on the job, what happens is that you learn, of course, how work is done in that specific company or organization. Um, and what Irene was just saying, so like mixing the grassroots with the, with the birds I view is also important in that context, because if I learn from my company how things are done and then I go to another company, you know, it may actually not even match. And if we are talking about innovation, um, if we're just trying out without having sort of like a, um, um, a training in like what are actually the capacities you need to train in to innovate, which is a huge buzzword that is like, what does it even mean to innovate, right? Um, then you may just go into the field and talk about innovation, but you don't really know how to do it. And I can see that there's like innovation departments in the UN, in other big organizations. But then again, when we're looking at what that means, um, a big question mark appears. And actually it turns out the private sector is much better at this because big companies um, have the resources and the understanding that they have to allocate um, resources to uh, research and development, you know, for product development and so on and so forth. And this is not so common in the more traditional social impact field. So this is just to give you a bit of an overview of how this conversation is happening and why this is interesting. And let's dive a little bit more into concrete examples. If you have questions or concrete examples yourself, please share in the chat as well. Um, but for now, let's see um, what we can tease out from the experiences and perspectives of our panelists. So John, if you, if you don't mind, I would love to hear from you a little bit about 
what you learned, but also from your perspective, what are the non-traditional opportunities in the field that are opening up? And what skills are most relevant from your perspective? And I will ask this question to all of you. So if you hear someone else saying one skill that you already wanted to say, maybe you can find another one or you can re-emphasize the one that you um, already heard because um, repetition is not a bad thing. So let's go. So your, your question regarding opportunities in the field opening up, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, but I think overall these opportunities are coming from a global shift in consciousness. The, the challenges that society faces are increasingly transnational in scope, but we lack the global governance frameworks to address them uniformly. So it's increasingly, you know, falling on the private sector to implement social impact, not just as a mandate in their CSR initiatives, but a built in pillar of their business models. And uh, furthermore, I think the younger generations are demanding it. You know, we're motivated largely by meaning in our work and not simply remuneration in our pay. Um, you know, for, for example, um, while I was representing Imani last year at the Global Social Entrepreneurship uh, Conference, we, we learned of a study that was done by the Mars Institute in Canada that the vast majority of investors want to invest in social enterprises, but the same majority of them have no idea how to find them or measure the risk or impact of their investments. So there's a demand for more socially conscious equity investment, but a gap in the market for how to deliver it. And, you know, as our institutions have always focused on the brass tax, what can I expect on my, on my return on investment? So I think every day there are new innovations coming to market to create social impact, but what makes me hopeful is this entire shift in the ecosystem that supports them. So we're seeing a much greater level of cooperation between academia, research institutions, government and regulatory bodies, and the investment institutions and private sector players that really take them to market. In Canada, we've now set up five innovation super clusters across the country, whereby we now have this very agile um, ability to talk throughout our hierarchy. Now, to what extent it's been successful in implementation, I don't know. But at the end of the day, it's promising to see that it's happening. You know, mm -hmm. So essentially right now, we can have social impact bankers that change the way we invest. You can have social impact lawyers that change the legal systems to help them thrive. You can have social impact accountants that share their knowledge with entrepreneurs to help them grow. You can have social impact Fortune 500 companies that incorporate, you know, triple bottom line or circular economy policies into their supply chain. So I think, unfortunately, international development practices have always been a decade behind the changing realities on the ground. But the sooner we can close these feedback loops, you know, to create meaningful change, the better. And it's a very ad hoc way, you know, way the world works. But I would like to think that it's uh, that it's happening. And uh, I think your second question was, what are the most relevant skills from my perspective? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to focus on one, and that is networking, networking, networking. Um, you know, your network is your capital, both in the traditional sense, but also in your soft skills. So, for example, one of our most famous teachers at Amani was uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Jerry White. And just last week, he was kind enough to spend three hours on Skype with me going through my business, my personal struggles, my skill gaps, and then helping me implement a plan of action to sort of take down some of my key problems. So he gave me several resources to help me reflect and hone my personal alignment and professional goals. And he also agreed to uh, introduce me to several major players to talk investment and business advisory. So, you know, fostering that network is key. And, you know, there was another saying taught to us in Omani about treating your network like your kitchen cabinet. So you never let your food rot in the back. You always have to reorganize and replenish these relationships in your network. Um, never have lunch alone, as they say, uh, because while someone may not be able to help you now or in a year, if you maintain these relationships, they make all the difference in the world in three years time. And the same goes for our ability, you know, to give back to the same network because we're all in this world together fighting the powers that be. And if we're all connected and engaged in the sharing of our knowledge and resources, then we can create impact much faster and more effectively. So that would be my key skill set, I would say, or thing you got to remember. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited that um, I'm also about the news for, for you know, yeah. Jerry, Jerry spending all the time with you. Jerry's my guy. He's helping. That is very, very cool. So yeah, this is actually speaking to one of the core um, assets, I think also that any, any of our investment in education should always include this question. How does it also help me to build a community and a network that will help me on my journey, right? 
-hmm. And it is, sometimes we need very specific networks that they are around our um, topic. And sometimes it is good to have a very vast network of very different kind of people, especially when you are interested in innovation um, and impact. You know, like these are two, these two big words, but impact is like, okay, I want to change something effectively. And how do you do that? If the most efficient way we, we describe as innovation, right? Innovation mm -hmm. is just really the process and the mindsets of trying to find the best way to do something um, with the most possible um, impact. So thanks for pointing that out. And of course, a um, little like uh, ad break um, in the social innovation management program. This is one of the core um, pillars that we bring people together from very different backgrounds, connect them to an exciting community and network of change makers. So because it's, it's not just your network, it's their network too. It's exactly. always the six degrees of separation and everything, every major opportunity that I've ever had in my life came from a handshake, certainly not an application on you know, online. So foster those as best you can. Yeah. Thanks so much for that um, advice, John. Um, next up, I would love to hear some input from you, Nolanda. Um, what are some things that you have found really um, valuable that you've learned in the program? Um, how do you see social impact professions in USA, perhaps, if you have anything to speak to that? Um, and what skills are most relevant from your perspective? Okay, well, I think the thing that has become the most um, apparent to me is that, um, especially since I left Amani and, and came back to the States and um, started to kind of figure out what move I wanted to make next, I think um, it's, I've seen, and this has been very refreshing to me, that there are just a lot more diverse voices and opinions that are in decision-making positions. And so inclusion is a really big um, part of the work that we do. And um, it's not, I think before it was kind of like an option and now it, it's like just good business to really make sure that you are um, trying to make sure that everyone is heard. Like, and I, to me, that's very exciting that I think that it changes Who's, who's around the table changes the types of decisions that are being made. And so that's something that I, I really have seen lately. I also think that um, before Amani, I really had certain um, ideas and expectations about nonprofits and NGOs. And now I realize that um, just because I've worked with several and just in, in working with the ones that I have worked with, just even the, the partnership that happen you know while you're at work i realized that you know a lot of organizations big or small have done things the same way for a really really long time and so for some places it's it's almost it's a little scary when people come in with really new ideas and so you have to find a balance of being able to be a good listener see what they're doing that's working really well and then be able to um, help people to move forward and, and to incorporate the idea of social innovation into the work that has been done for so long. You know, my mm. boss and her counterpart have been at the organization for 20 years. They've mm. been doing things the same way for 20 years. And, but the organization is at a new place and they really see the value in bringing in new ideas and they want people who and think outside of the box who want to be innovative. And so it's really, you know, a lot of times people, I think, you know, we have an, uh, we think, you know, this is just how things are and they don't want to change, but mm -hmm. people really do value it. So it's a really exciting time to be involved. And I think skills that are most important and relevant, I think you have to be flexible. I think passion goes a long way. You, I think any job that I've ever gotten is because it wasn't because of the education background I had. I mean, that'll get you in the door, that'll get you to interview. But people want to work with people, especially in social impact that are passionate about what they're talking about. Mm. When you're dealing with clients, they wanna know that you care. They wanna know that you're not putting them in a box and just, you know, it's like, oh, I'm here to save you. The best thing about working with clients every day for me is, first of all, you realize we're, we're all going through the same types of things. And you have to be able to look across the table and get someone to, you know, they come in, a lot of times you'll talk to somebody, they'll come in and they're almost embarrassed to be there. 
and mm-hmm. you want them, the goal every day should be that they leave knowing that if even at one of the worst times in my life, there are people, perfect strangers that I've never met before that care about me because I'm a human being and they, they need to leave with a smile on their face. They need to leave with encouragement. They need to know that people care and that doesn't matter what's going on. One conversation with somebody can really make a difference in their life, their children's lives, and everybody that they come into contact with. And so leading from a place of love um, and just knowing that it's, it, we are, everything we do, it is, it shifts everything else that happens um, around us. And so what you say matters, how you talk to people matter, the work we're doing matters. It can be exhausting. Um, so you have to figure out how to find that balance, but it's the greatest feeling in the world to be exhausted at the end of the day, but be able to smile and say, wow, I really, you know, I really took that. That was a great conversation I had with that person or to get yeah. an email or something and know you really made a difference in somebody's life. And that's at the end of the day, we're all here to do that. And so I think that's, that's what I've learned that, you know, there's a lot of people out there and that's what they want to do. They want to go to work and be excited about being at work. And, and you don't know if that necessarily, if you're somebody who's miserable in your job, you don't know if that's necessarily possible. And, and it really is uh, possible when you find the right organization, the right, you get to craft your career. It is a, a real thing. You can do it. You don't have to just accept, uh, you know, being unhappy at work. You spend a lot of time there. So enjoy yeah. it. So a mind is an opportunity to, you know, teach you how to do that. It's possible to have a career where you really know that you're making an impact. So, thank you so much, Nolanda, for sharing that. And I think something that that um, stood out to me is like um, around, you know, our anxieties when we're thinking about how do I build my career and so on and so forth. So something John was saying is about the network piece. Like it has happened through a handshake, so getting out there, but also how we show up and who we are matters and of course this is also a frightening thought because it's like what if other people don't like me <laughs> but there's something about um, 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 the work that we can do to to really connect to something that is larger than us which is what you said about passion so if we can find out some things that we care about enough to actually put ourselves out there you know when the when the passion the courage is bigger than our fears then really we start um i think flowing i see that in so many different lives um i've been teaching over the last six years 250 professionals from 60 different countries so i see it yet again and again and again so thank you for pointing that out and another thing i also heard was around um something that I would put under entrepreneurship skills is like, if you want to come into an existing company or organization and change something there, you will meet resistance. It doesn't matter if it's within an organization or in the world, you're working with communities, you have a social enterprise or you work in impact investing, or you try to change the bank that you work in. You will always meet resistance because the world has a thing about change and, and meeting that with resistance. So learning the skills, how to not give up there and then find a better way and how to actually get there is something that you will need as a professional that wants to create social impact and then again if you care enough about the topic you will not give up so that's a really important piece and it's actually part of our social innovation management framework to help people find that piece that they care enough about or help them navigate finding that and, and, and as they are on their journey so let's um, uh, move to you Ryan I want to hear a little bit from you about your experience and your thoughts on those skills okay Hello again. Um, so I want to start with uh, talking about the skills that I find relevant. Um, and I have three that I want to share right now. The first one is, I would call it like an ability and a willingness to ask questions, to question what we think we know, um, and to reframe things. So you call it design thinking or beginner's mindset. Um, but that ability and willingness to question things. A quick example of that recently, we were doing some outreach uh, in the city here, and we had like a random selection of addresses that we were reaching out to. And when we got our responses back, um, the majority of responders were homeowners. It was like 98% homeowners, even though like 50% of the people living here are renters, they live in apartments. And it kind of confirmed this bias that 
people who rent don't want to be involved in their community. And that when we saw those numbers, that's what was said in the meeting, like, oh, renters don't engage. And they were just going to move on. And I said, hey, can we, can we ask, like, can we look into that and just not assume that? And they said, no, like, that's just how it is. But I asked, like, can you allow me to go and look into that? And they were like, sure. And what, after looking into it, I found that the random sample of addresses that we had were from, like, subscriptions to waste management, which was homeowners and landlords. So no one living in an apartment would have received any kind of communication from us. And so it was actually our fault. It <laughs> wasn't the renters. <laughs> and so, but no one was asking that question. It just kind of confirmed that bias. And so having the skill and the, the confidence to, to like pause and question and dig a little deeper, um, whatever you want to call that, design thinking, beginner's mindset, that's a really important skill to have. Another one, and this was kind of talked about, Have I lost you, Ryan? I think you did. Oh, no. Well, um, until he comes back, I think to sum it up is like the... the like I'm an ENFP. <laughs> so, oh, you're so, back? I don't know what happened. Yeah, we lost you. We lost you for a second. Um, so if you... Okay. Yeah. If you can just repeat the last sentence you said. Sure. Um, okay. Out, but just... Um, I was starting, I was moving on to my second skill. Does that make sense with where I got out? Okay, yeah. Um, so um, I would say, no. Oh no. I think no, nobody else is hearing as well. Is that just me? I uh, <laughs> it's coming back when I <laughs> when I say something. Well, Ryan, it looks like your internet has a bit of a breakdown here. You want to try one more time? <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Is it? Okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll try to be quick so it doesn't cut out. I was just gonna say, kind of. Um, willingness to put in hard work and then resilience so having self-care um having a balance where you're it can be really hard work to work in social impact because you meet resistance you're a lot of times focused on the problems <laughs> in the world and so you do need to have kind of take care of your emotional and spiritual um, um I, one of the questions I have is the opportunities that exist for people interested in global work. Um, mm -hmm. Something that I would... Well, that is too bad. Say that, that's kind of counterintuitive. Oh, is, is it cut out again? Yeah, it's cutting out maybe, again. Maybe, maybe, maybe try stopping your video just so it lowers the bandwidth yeah. there. Um, Wow, Wi-Fi problems in the U.S. Who would have thought? <laughs> um, <laughs> is this better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so looking for opportunities to do global work. In my experience, um, starting local was kind of what worked for me. Um, volunteering with organizations, um, especially that have a global reach. So it could be something like Rotary International or for me, part of it was like my doing service through my local church and that kind of connected me to a global network and part of those connections is how I became aware of the job in Kenya. Um, but even before I went there, I was in the work that I was doing on the side, volunteering, I had that global connection. Um, and so I would say kind of no matter where you are, um, that's something to do. It helps you build your network, volunteering, um, it helps you keep different perspectives coming in um, and it kind of like feeds into that design thinking and different perspectives. So even if you already are in kind of a track to do a career with impact, I would say um, try to bring other things into your life. Get on a board, volunteer at a shelter or something just to kind of keep that uh, your world a little bit expanded. Um, 
<laughs> I'm kind of thrown off by all the cutting out, so I'm just gonna gonna stop there. I yeah. hope I answered your question. You... Well, thanks for sharing. I mean, you've you've you have had an international career, so I think anyone interested from the U.S. and 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 if they have any more questions, maybe if you have if you're listening, you have any more questions, feel free to send them to me, and I'm happy to connect you um, also with Brian if he has more answers for you. So. Um, obviously, Profello has so many beautiful, amazing opportunities um, always on the website and the newsletter about how you can um, find fellowships or study abroad programs um, that can help you with this. And obviously, Amani Institute also um, is an exciting opportunity for you to actually build a CV worthy, um, really relevant work experience in a country like India, Brazil, or Kenya, which then um, automatically links you up to different scenes and helps you build in a network that you can then bring back as an asset to any organization that you will work in, either in the US or in other countries around the world. So there are so many different possibilities. But before we close, I would love for, um, to see if Irene um, is still here. I know that you struggled with your- And I also have internet issues. Yes. You know, I, I know I was in the U.S. just the other month. I also struggled a little bit, but in Germany, it's not that much better. So trust me, it's, it's everywhere. Um, yeah, so I'll make it quick. Um, so yeah, in terms of skills, I think there's three that um, have stood out to me a lot. And, and it's all kind of the, the common thread is um, like the world today is changing like so quickly. Like in the past, you know, like Gigi said, you could go to a school, you could get a degree on something and then you have that like, you know, content knowledge. And then you feel like, you know, you're probably ready to jump into a job and then you just like do that job. But now, like, I mean, everything's moving so quickly that even when you're on the job, you have to constantly learn. And so kind of echoing what, Ryan was saying in the beginning, have a beginner's and learner's mindset. And so like really carving out time for yourself to constantly read, you know, new knowledge, new articles, um, new trends so that you're really up to date. And I think this is especially important in social innovation. Um, and then the second one is um, the, your own adaptability um, and your willingness to experiment and to your willingness to you know, think of an idea and then try it and then like iterate and get feedback um, instead of kind of spending all this time to want to come up with the perfect thing. And then it's like, then it's going to take a lot of time. You're like crippled by your own inertia. Um, and I think that's, that's super important um, when you're, yeah, when you're trying to um, make, a, make a good career. I think in, in, in this space. Um, and then the third one is the interpersonal skills. Um, and this is, you know, I, I think nowadays it's no longer enough, especially in the social space to just show up as a professional, but you have to really like bring your whole self to work. And, and, and um, Nolanda was saying before, like this is a space that's really for people with passion. You come into this space because this has a personal connection to you. And so how do you show up as a full person, but also, you know, deal with your own ego and um, like have a certain level of maturity that you can, you can bring your whole self, but at the same time, um, still contribute in a very, very professional way and, and, and work with your colleagues in a professional way. And, and, and I have to say, this is something that I got the most out of at Amani. Um, and I realized because, you know, I had a lot of, um, I think, like self-doubt and fear and things that I didn't even realize about myself that was, you know, um, stopping me from taking even more risks and experiment even more and um and and, and um, interact with my colleagues in a way that you know like i think i like saw like the same kind of pattern kept kind of repeating um and and i saw that in my own colleagues as well and so i think amani was super helpful to to really help me learn about myself learn about why i even am doing this work in the first place because i think that's super important for you, just your own longevity in the yeah. social space because it's not easy work it's not private sector work where you're designing a product service for anyone who could pay for it 
right? Like you're, you're like, you're trying to do something that is going to, you know, provide agency um, and opportunities and, you know, for, for people that cannot pay for this stuff with your own, like, like severe constraints and resources as an organization. Um, and so you have to be extremely creative. You have to be, you know, extremely um, efficient. And I think the networking piece that um, John was talking about earlier is super important because you really have to rely on a lot of capital that is not financial. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so like all of the skills, the interpersonal skills, your adaptability, your willingness to take risk, you know, all of that becomes super, super important. And so I would say that this was the biggest piece that I got from Amani. Um, and yeah, and it's helped me so, so much in my job. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that, Irene. Yeah, and, and it's really important what you're saying is because when we talk about innovation specifically, um, again, it's like, am, am, I, am I a person that is willing to fail and to take risks and to try yeah. things out and reach out and so on? And it's easier said than done. So it's really helpful to have actually a community that you can trust, that you can go um, through a growth process with to actually um, really unlock that potential that you feel that you have when you wake up and you're like, this, what is the biggest impact that I can make? So everyone, um, it's time for questions. We are actually at a full hour now. So to respect your time, if you want to jump off, feel free. Um, and you can also send questions per email and we're happy to respond to them. Um, if you, John and Nolanda and Irene, if you still have five or ten, seven minutes, um, feel free to stick also around. We'd love to see if anyone here in the webinar has questions. I see Nadze has something. She says, do fellows earn a stipend from the organizations they work with during the social innovation management program? So no, they don't. And there's a reason why. So there is... Um, for good reasons, very strict regulations, uh, specifically in Kenya and India and Brazil as well around um, work from foreign, um, foreign professionals. So in the, in the course of four months, it is impossible for you to get a work um, permit. So this is why um, none of the apprenticeships are um, actually paid apprenticeships. Um, so yeah, so you have to put into your financial considerations the cost of living and accommodation, transport, and so on um, in, in each country. Um, there is a question from Jeff saying, is there any good word to refer to someone who is good at working for innovation or changes in how we do something while listening at the same time to people already doing it? Um, I am not sure I understand the question. Maybe, maybe what you're trying to say, Jeff, is um, if, if you, you're trying to describe someone that has a beginner's mindset, so is listening to other people, but in the same time is actually really professional and good at working already. Let me know if that's what you were saying. And I don't know what the word would be, but I would say maybe an adaptive leader. Um, I think in adaptive leadership, it's really important that you know what your strengths are, but in the same time, you're always listening and willing to listen to other people. And what Ryan was referring to as well earlier is like being willing to test our assumptions. Actually, I think this makes you very good um, as an innovator. Um, then Natsa is asking, is there a way to be connected to any fellow who participated in the program in Brazil? Um, Yes, absolutely. Um, if you send me an email afterwards, um, I'm happy to connect you to one of the fellows that did the program in Brazil. Actually, we have some people in North America that um, did the program in Brazil, but they are um, today not here, So, um, but I'm happy to connect you. Who else might have questions? Do you have any questions for John or Irene or Nolanda? And Irene and Nolanda, if you can also put your LinkedIn into the chat, that would be great. So people can connect with you if they like to. You, there's no stupid questions. You can ask any questions that you want. Um, oftentimes, the questions that you have in mind, another person also has in mind. So you're actually doing the group a favor if you ask. <laughs> I am going to stop sharing for now here. So I can also see again the room. Um, 
where's the future of social innovation heading? This is such a great question. <laughs> John, do you want to take that? <sighs> Again, loaded questions. Um, at the end of the day, here's how I look at things. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of complex systems change. So you got to view a problem in its entirety, analyzing the relationships that influence and intersect over time. You know, I think, I think true social change lies in being able to challenge people's priorities, beliefs, habits, and loyalties. You know, these are the things that uphold and uh, sustain the status quo. So every challenge we face in this world, um, as Amani will teach you, is an iceberg. And most of the funding and solutions in the past have been targeted only at that visible surface of the iceberg. And it's our duty as change makers to go under the water and really adjust these confluence of reasons that the challenges persist. And just going back to the assumption, uh, assumptions thing everyone keeps talking about, that's a, a key pillar at Amani is uh, they really help you cut through the assumptions. The assumptions you have about why societal challenges exist, assumptions about the solutions you think are viable, and most importantly, the assumptions about you have about yourself what you're good at, what you're capable of, what really makes your heart tick and what passion you should pursue. And I think, you know, we tell ourselves stories every day and it's our responsibility to reflect on the validity of those stories, to challenge our word, worldview and our ideas about how we can go about creating the kind of world we want to see. And in terms of the future of social innovation, I think it's really key that we continue to sit in the problems longer than we do. And by that, I mean having the patience to really start asking the right questions and collecting the right information so that we can formulate solutions that we would have otherwise had no idea were there. Often we're attempted to uh, you know, attack immediately. And for example, in my company, we've been under a constant process of revision to redefine the problem of food insecurity and post-harvest crop loss, and thus our solutions as they constantly need to be adapted to the context of those we work with. So mm -hmm. the problems facing Ghana with the loss of yams after harvest are quite different than the problems of crop loss in the US. And so it's our, my duty to develop business plans that are constantly adapted to these different realities and agile enough to change as they need it. So I think the future requires us to be extremely cognizant of uh, the complexity of the world we live in and agile in our ability to constantly uh, redefine what we think to be true. So that we can never go into a, a problem solving session, whether it be a product, a service, an idea, an NGO, um, with any sort of preset, preconceived notions as to what the real solution is. We have to very much absorb and be comfortable in the uncomfortable that is complex challenges. Thank, thanks, John. And I think maybe one thing that you, you were saying, you know, like you're, you're thinking about business models and how in different contexts they have to be adapted. And I think this kind of like sparked in me this whole thought about, you know, future of social innovation, like, you know, just a decade ago, everyone was talking about social entrepreneurship. It was like the new thing. And then social innovation became the big buzzword. And I think when I'm looking into the future of work trends, I actually predict that you know, this is like the, the world beyond boundaries that we envision at Armani. It's like, it's actually happening that the private sector is, is headed towards um, uh, considering social impact just because of like the limited resources we have on this planet and also people's movement. So all of these little puzzle pieces are really important to actually um, make that happen. But I have a lot of faith that that can happen. And so anyone who wants to work in private sector should go for it because we need a lot of change makers in the private sector. Um, we had um, a question from Nicole for current undergraduate students. What are your two best pieces of advice for making the most of your educational opportunity? Um, and then we had another question. There's a huge pool from Sheena. There's a huge pool of soon to retire retired professionals with a wealth of knowledge is Amani open to tapping into this pool a hundred percent. So um, if you have something specific in mind around this, please let me know. But definitely this is like one of our working models is to bring people together from different backgrounds and also different ages. So in our program, sometimes you can find someone who's actually um, over 50 years old. Um, both on the instructor side, of course, there is like the, the, the more senior um, uh, uh, experts that we bring in as instructors, but even as fellows, we have people from a really wide range of age groups. Um, the biggest bulk of people is around, I think, 27 to 35, perhaps, but there is outliers. And we always find that these are people that come in with an extraordinary um, beginner's mindset learning um, ability that is quite amazing and, and, and a willingness to share the wealth of mm. knowledge. But Sheena, please do share what you have in mind when you say that. Um, and then, Nicole, what, who wants to take Nicole's question um, around the two best pieces of advice for making the most of your educational opportunity in undergrad? I've got a thought if no one else does. Let's see, Nolanda or Irene, what, what, do you have something? 
No, I was <laughs> way beyond undergrad. I don't even know. Yeah. No. Well, let, let, should, should um, um, John and then Olanda, if you have something, you can go after. So, um, I, when I was working for the Human Rights Research and Education Center at my, uh, during my undergrad, I was surrounded by double masters, PhDs, everything under the sun, and I was certainly out, outside of my, my comfort zone working on a, a big UN project. But the fact of the matter was I had worked for three years with uh, indigenous communities in Northern Quebec here in Canada. And so I brought uh, you know, a, a perspective or a viewpoint that nobody else had had. Just um, you know, as somebody was mentioned earlier, a lot of academics never really get to step outside their comfort zone and onto the ground. And so don't ever say no to an opportunity that you have during undergraduate. Always, always join the clubs, go to the meetings, go to the conferences, because these small little things that you will do to pad your resume, are going to pay off huge. It, it, it's such a such a competitive job market right now for people in development, and and the only way to distinguish yourself is is to not only have something that sticks out on your on your CV, but also you develop those soft skills, those cross cultural perspectives, and all these other soft skills that you simply can't you know uh, quantify. So never say no to an opportunity in your undergrad. Don't worry about, you know, lack of sleep. You're young. You'll, you'll heal. You'll be okay. Um, <laughs> stress, is, stress is okay. Don't worry about it. Everything within reason. But um, I would just say always, always seek out these, these small little things that your school has to offer that nobody taps into because I, I remember applying to a couple of different things saying, oh, I'll never get this. And then you get it because guess what? Not many people are even looking at it. So just always seek and destroy any and all opportunities when you're young to, uh, to diversify your skill set. I agree with that. I would just add to um, study something that you're interested in and everything else will fall into place. And if you don't know what that is yet, just be open to figuring that out and know that you have time to do that. But that, that's the most important thing you can do for your career is to find something you care about because there's a lot of people with degrees and things that they don't even use because they went into it for the wrong reason. So just focus on that and um, the rest will fall into place. Thanks for sharing that, Nolanda. I, I totally agree. And it will lead you to really interesting places. Sometimes we think, you know, it's that, and then actually we, we get into the job market and then we find a completely other thing and that's totally fine too, but that was then your journey. Um, does social innovation occur frequently in the government sector? If so, there, are there some good examples? If not, why and what would it take to make it happen more often? This is a very good question, Kate Tam. Um, there is examples for social innovation in public sectors across the world. Um, there are some labs that are trying to address that and push for it. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, know about a lab in, in Brazil and in Switzerland. Um, it is more likely that it will that innovation will be pushed from um, civil society um, uh, groups, but there are some there are some examples. But I think the reason why it's not happening as often as we would like to is because of very entrenched structures and that institutions and bureaucracies work really slowly. Sometimes there is an advantage to that when there's like whimsical changes and everyone thinks this is like the new thing and then you know it passes by and it had, the government has been untouched by it. But of course, um, um, there's also very um, big downsides to it. Um, yeah, so this is what I have to say to this. Maybe Nolanda or John, you have another opinion on it. Anyone? I was just going to say that uh, often your, your champions for change making within the government are people that have been sitting in that position for 25, 30 years, the people with the power to actually create the difference. I've worked with, you know, directors and top level people. And at the end of the day, it's some of the ideas that we're coming up with are so new that it's hard for them to even get their minds around. So even though government does move slow, if we are in government, it's our duty to be champions for these new things. It's, you know, it's hard sometimes to put your neck out there and the, there's a lot of you know, strict hierarchy when it comes to government agencies, but it's still our duty to make it known to those that do have an, uh, an ear to the ground to become champions for these new, new innovative in initiatives. And um, I think it's just, we always have to be cognizant that we are talking to uh, people with their own sets of ideas that they've grown up with. And so it's as best we can to uh, subtly make these changes of mindset. Yeah. 
at Armani Institute, we had a few fellows actually in Argentina specifically um, that worked within the government. So they have some uh, interesting stories to tell about it, but unfortunately some more, more frustrated stories, but they tried. Um, and there are some movements, um, especially I think Latin America has interesting examples. Um, but yeah, again, coming back to creating change, um, no matter in which sector you do it, you will, you will need to you know, have um, grit, resilience, a passion for it. You will need to seek, um, have a learner's mindset, a lifelong learning mindset and seek to improve your skills, be willing to test your assumptions. Really important to have a community that you can trust, that can play back if you have blind spots that um, you can find mentors in, as John was mentioning in the beginning. Um, and so if you have more questions about um, your next steps um, um, with regards to Amani Institute, if you're interested in the postgraduate program in social innovation management that our panelists have gone through, um, please let me know. I just shared my email here in the chat happy to talk with you and um, um, the panelists have also shared their LinkedIn with you so you uh, feel free to connect with them ask them questions and um, they've all had their own personal journeys obviously within the program everyone comes from a different background take something different out of it you could see how different also the careers were of everyone um, but what unites us I think is actually a bit of a resilient hope that things can be better and that we can play a role in making that happen. And as Nolanda was saying so beautiful earlier, is like it's really possible to shape your career. So don't let anyone else tell you otherwise and um, take agency and uh, be curious, ask questions, connect, take risks, invest in your education. Um, this is this is maybe perhaps the best um, the best place you can actually invest in and um, uh, the world will thank you for it. So this is uh, me closing the webinar. I saw most of you have stuck all this time throughout the webinar with us. So there has been some um, um, curiosity and interest. We hope that it was useful for you. And please don't feel shy to reach out and do what John was preaching in the beginning and be active about building your network. We can't shake hands right now virtually, but we can connect and perhaps we will meet someday in person. And even if we don't, I'm very confident and very happy that I know that there are so many people around the world that actually want to create change. So thank you for that. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you so much Nolanda, John, thank you so much for the opportunity, Vicky and um, Ryan and Irene as well. Take care guys. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.